stop chatting. Shh. Hi guys, welcome to Wolf Den Podcast. How you doing? How's it going? Chat was getting real weird because it was uh, it was a uh, it was it was a little quiet during the intro. I was making my coffee. I took a little extra time today. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a double drink episode here on today's episode of the Wolf Den it Podcast. Sure Not only do I have my water, but I have uh tea going because i got the tummy troubles bob you believe that oh I've, i could have guessed if you asked <laughs> i i would have assumed yeah uh i would have had coffee but i would like to go to sleep <laughs> uh yeah i have given that all up so i am uh just ready to never sleep uh yeah so here we are. I made I made a bullshit pumpkin spice. That's what I call it, a bullshit pumpkin spice. <laughs> Aren't all pumpkin spice bullshit, if we're being honest with ourselves. True. I, I don't Karen. have syrup. Okay. I don't have syrup, so what I do is I, 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 I do a little vanilla extract, a little uh, caramel, and a little hazelnut, and then I put the pumpkin spice spices. You know? Mm-hmm. Bob Big Beard. Yes, I have a big beard. <laughs> It does look particularly bushy today, and I saw you on Saturday, and I don't know what changed in the interim. It's just, it has a mind of its own. Just exploded outwards. (laughs) Uh, Hey, Ackmeister, thanks for the 13 months. Oslo's, thank you for the gifted sub. Blackbird, thanks for the seven months. Thanks for all you guys do. Thanks, Blackbird. And Jay Cannon, thanks for the 19 months. Shoe that Bayonetta thing, am I right? Yeah, she uh, like, 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 was that? Whoo! Like, whoa! Boy, that like, sheesh! As, as I think that's said. what the, I think that's what they're referring to. Mm. Because yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, and I'm glad some more things came to light today. We're yeah. gonna talk about the Bayonetta three controversy. How the voice mm-hmm. actor, the original voice actor of Bayonetta, didn't come back, and there's a reason mm-hmm. for that. Yep. And uh, we still don't know what the re- <laughs> we still don't really know who to believe what the reason it's is. It's important but... to remember there are two sides to every story. Yes, uh, technically three: yours, mine, and the truth. Oh, whoa! Yeah. Okay. There's also Xbox Design Lab stuff. Yes. Finally, that's exciting. Um, there's also PS5 DualSense Edge stuff. In another clear case of uh, WWE AEW mentality, uh, Sony's like, "Oh, they did something. We have to do the exact same thing on the exact same day." Yeah, I don't know. It looked like PlayStation did it first, but we'll get to the bottom of that. Yeah, uh, uh, Razer Ed- Edge, the new handheld console by Razer. Yeah, uh, we got our first look at it finally, and it's pretty disappointing. Also, I want to talk about how G4, uh, the T- one of the TV channels that we grew up with, yes, uh, shut down again. Again. <laughs> uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff we should talk yes. about. Uh, anything else we should know? I think we're good. I think we can yeah, go into we'll it, right? Dive right into it. Um, should I start with the Polygon article? Because that gives like a good history of it, and then we yeah. can go into the... Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So, original Bayonetta voice actor Helena Taylor. Helena Taylor. Helena or Helena? Uh, Helena. It's Helena. British. I'm going to say Helena. Helena Taylor said that pl- developer Platinum Games' insulting pay rate kept her from voicing the character in Bayonetta 3. Taylor published a series of videos via Twitter on Saturday in which she detailed her reasons for turning down the role, claiming that Platinum Games gave her a final offer of $4,000 for the iconic role. Um, Bayonetta 3 director Yosuke uh, Mayada confirmed in October that Taylor would not be reprising her role in the franchise's third game. Instead, Jennifer Hale, a prolific voice actor known for her roles as Mass Effect's Commander Shepard and Overwatch's Ash, would take over as the voice of Bayonetta. Uh, Miata, uh, Miata told Game Informer that overlapping circumstances kept Taylor from reprising her role. We held auditions to cast a new voice for Bayonetta and offered the role to Jennifer Hale, whom we felt was a good match for the character. Miata told Game Informer, I understand the concerns some fans have about the voice change at this point in the series, but Jennifer's performance was be- was way beyond what we ha- what we could have imagined. 
Taylor disputed that characterization and said that she too auditioned for the role and passed with flying colors. She said she first received a lower offer before writing to Platinum Games co-founder Hideki Kamiya uh, to ask for more. Uh, that's when she said she was offered $4,000 for the role. This is an insult to me, the amount of time that I took to work on my talent and everything that I have been given uh, to this game and the fans, Taylor said. I am asking the fans to boycott this game and, it's spe- and instead spend their money um, donating to charity. In the days since Taylor's original tweets, uh, where she also described declining mental health and suicidal inten- uh, intentions after declining the role, um, her videos have amassed more than 800,000, uh, 80,000 retweets. Neither Platinum Games nor Nintendo have responded to Polygon's request for comment. Platinum Games' uh, Kamiya appeared to respond to Taylor's allegations Saturday via Twitter, sad and deplorable about the attitude of untruths. Uh, that's what I could tell you now. By the way, beware my rules. His, his rules. Yeah, his rules are is, don't talk to him in anything other than Japanese or he will block you. Yeah. Which is interesting because he tweeted this in English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, also, no repeated questions, no tagging him in conversations, and no advice. Mm-hmm. Basically, just don't talk to him. Yeah. He, blo- he fucking blocks everybody. Do they uh, go Kanye's on to Twitter- talk about how he uh, uh, re- he deleted, he deactivated his Twitter for about yeah. two days? He briefly uh, restricted during Saturday's blocking spree before he deleted and reactivated his account. He made no other direct comment about Taylor's accusations. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to this article, Platinum Games' $4,000 offer is not ex- uh, exceptionally low for a lot of voice actors. Video game voice actors have spoken out on Twitter over the weekend about how notoriously low pay something the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, or SAG-AFTRA, has previously addressed. SAG is a labor union for actors, which Taylor is a member of, that regulates minimum rates for eligible performers and workers. Video game voice actors must be paid $956.75 per four-hour days, with three voices maximum, under current SAC terms, the hour the hourly rate is four hundred and seventy eight dollars and fifty cents for a single voice, with three hundred and nineteen added for additional voices. Bonus pay is tacked on for the number of sessions it takes to record the game. Second and secondary compensation line: the SAG AFTRA voice actors won after eleven month strike in twenty sixteen. Hold on, we we talked yes. about numbers, so obviously I'm confused. Okay. Uh, Video game voice actors must be paid $956 per four hour days. Yes. So that's oh, with so that's three one day maximum. So that's one day with four hours in it. Yeah. Um, and up to three because voice actors generally do more than one voice. That's for three voices maximum. The hourly rate is four hundred and seventy eight dollars for a single voice with three hundred and nineteen dollars yes. added. So if the hourly rate is four hundred and seventy eight dollars. What is this nine hundred and fifty six dollars per four hour day? That that's if you're going to work a four hour day and perform up to three different voices in that day. A maximum of three voices. Yes. So you can the, do one voice. Yeah, that would be the four seventy eight. So if you just want to do one or I guess less than four hours, it would be four seventy eight mm-hmm. per hour. Mm hmm. Okay. And then bonuses are tacked on. And that's the SAG after yeah. rate. But to be yes. fair, talk about the main character here. Probably yes. a little more money. And and I mean four thousand uh, <laughs> dollars which which is what she claimed was the total. Yeah. Does which we'll seem get, no. does seem low. Yeah. But Taylor previously told a Nintendo podcast in twenty eighteen that she recorded her lines for both Bayonetta one and two over four days with each session lasting four hours. In this case, the $4,000 minimum pay rate would line up. It isn't clear how long Bayonetta 3 is or how many voice lines there were to record, but Taylor is reprising an iconic role in the franchise that sold millions of games over the years. Uh, Exploitation of voice actors is not new, said voice director Elena Zebro to Polygon. Uh, So many indie projects especially have... Uh, low low VA rates per dollars per final line delivered or worse a flat rate for the entire project 
That means well under a dollar per line. Um, update. Bayonetta 3 voice actress Jennifer Hale has responded to the discussion around the game and its voice actors. Hale published a statement on Twitter writing that she supports every actor's right to be paid well and that she's an advocate. she's been an advocate of this for years. Uh, she noted, however, that she hasn't signed a not that she, sorry, she has signed a non-disclosure agreement and cannot speak directly about the situation. Uh, full text is as follows. Hold on. With regard, I, I, I want to no. back up. We we yeah. we didn't really say too much about what uh, uh, Helena Taylor's uh, uh, post was originally about. That she right. she she posted three Twitter videos, which are about two minutes each, um, yeah. and she basically details that uh, they offered her four thousand dollars for 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 the role of of Bayonetta, which she yeah. claims is tied to her. <laughs> which she, she she the reason why I didn't really this was going nuts on Twitter over the weekend. The reason why I didn't yeah. really say anything was the first tweet totally fine, understandable. I understand your outrage. It's a little weird. She waited this long right before the game comes out to to to. Well, I mean, to now be this be mad about time, it because this is this is the start of you know the hype cycle for it. Right. So now it makes sense to like get out there like, hey, don't buy this game. Here's why. I thought it was a little weird to expect people to boycott the game because you didn't get paid enough. I mean, that's that's kind of. So you have to kind of opt to do that. That's like the fans have to decide yeah. that that they want to do that. You know, it's very that, that it's egregious to, enough that they would want to help you in that way. It's very ballsy to come out and say like to basically you know act as the figurehead, the face of a franchise that you're no longer associated with. Yeah, and try to a- ask the fan base to boycott an upcoming game. Um, because I mean, look, I un- I I get that she's mad. I understand, but Bayonetta was never Metal Gear Solid, <laughs> and you didn't see David Hayter tell people to boycott Phantom Pain. Yeah. when Kiefer Sutherland, he was involved. very upset. He but... was yes, he was very upset about it. But um, another thing, did David Hayter go after Keith for Sutherland? Because at the end no. of this whole diatribe, Helena Taylor. <laughs> went after the new voice actress what's her name again uh jennifer, jennifer hale. hale she yeah. went he, she went after jennifer hale and said that you have no right to voice bayonetta and uh and basically i'm the real bayonetta fuck you basically yeah it was like that i was like all right i don't know i, I can't support this like i yeah. like i uh, i understand you probably got shafted but why are you going after the new voice actress who probably had nothing yeah, to do with your your yeah, dispute? She's literally just doing her job, which is to perform yeah. a part. Yeah, it's like going after a scab for, in a yeah. in a union job, like when everybody's striking. It's like it's like attacking the scab. Uh, but she doesn't even know she's a scab in this <laughs> at, at this point. So that all seemed very strange uh yeah. anyway there's more updates that we have yeah um oh, the, the, whole, the whole the whole internet or? the whole internet at the time was thinking about boycotting bayonetta because it's fucked up that the a voice actress the the lead role of the whole game's only getting paid four thousand dollars that's fucked up yeah. and i under and, and I mean, that makes a lot of sense it's a little weird does- the way she worded it but it, it's, it does it's, legitimately it does legitimately like raise questions about like how much are video game voice actors being paid obviously they're not being paid as much as like people who do disney films or even like television animation uh, i think the cast of the simpsons get a million dollars per episode which is ridiculous um you know they're obviously at the insane. lower end of they're at the lower end of the totem pole basically um and especially for someone like uh helena taylor who is the voice of the franchise up until fairly recently, you would expect a little bit more compensation than just, you know, $4,000. You would expect, you know, because she's going to be carrying the whole game and she's carried the whole series up to this point. You would expect better compensation for that. Yeah. So it, it's it it's good to bring up the conversation that voice actors yeah. and actresses are are 
not being paid that much. Even with this union rate, it's a pretty low rate. If yeah. that there, sh- I mean, there should be. It seems like this rate is based off of just anybody voicing anything, but it should really be if you're the face of the of the fucking franchise, yeah. <laughs> like there should be a little more compensation for that. But anyway, uh, do we want to read Jennifer Hale's thing? Because I don't even think it, it, it her. I don't even think her response even matters. It's basically just uh, I can't say anything because I'm under an NDA. But uh, I hope everybody uh, figures this out. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, I just thought it was uh, interesting. She. When she said, I am under an NDA and I'm not at liberty to speak regarding the situation. My reputation speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's a seasoned voice actress. So yeah, she's it's not like honestly, she's she's a bigger name than Helena Taylor. <laughs> it's not like, like they got any it. old schmo. They got somebody. Yeah, who, like, I can name at least doing. five games that Jennifer Hale has been in. I can, I can only name two or three that Helena Taylor has been in. Bayonetta, Bayonetta 2 and Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> As Bayonetta. <laughs> yeah, so it's really bizarre that uh, uh, she would go after Jennifer Hale like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then she goes on to say, sincerely ask that everyone keep in mind that this game was created by an entire team of hardworking, dedicated people, and I hope everyone will keep an eye about what they've created. Finally, I hope that everyone involved may resolve their differences in an amicable and respectful way. She's saying... Maybe consider not boycotting the game because there's a lot more people involved, which is another conversation to be had because people, uh, uh, I, I saw this uh, uh, discourse on Twitter uh, talking about how uh, boycotting a game is bad for the hundreds and sometimes thousands of people who work on the game. Yeah. So sometimes they get bonuses if a game does really good. You know, sometimes, yeah. I mean, oftentimes they get fired when when the game is done because there's nothing else for yeah. them to do but if you if the game sells well they might want to support it for a while so they might p- keep people on or they might want to make a second one or they might see like hey these people did really good we want to keep them on for some more so yeah it yeah. it also sends a very it, it always sends the wrong message because what's going to happen is if, if people boycott this game to the effect that you know sales are significantly impacted what that's going to tell uh platinum and nintendo isn't it's not going to tell them that you know they need to bring uh helena taylor back to voice bayonetta what it's going to tell them is nobody likes bayonetta we're not going to make bayonetta games right. anymore that's what right. it's going to say it's i mean it's not really the same thing but it's kind of also the argument with uh hogwarts legacy people want to boycott that game because jk rowling sucks but by doing so you are you're affecting you know avalanche who's making the game and all the developers who just want to make a good harry potter game um, yeah. So do you boycott the game and stand by your principles while also running the risk of never getting a Harry Potter game again and also a development studio possibly going out of business? The only games I've boycotted are uh, Ubisoft games for the most part yep. because like yeah. Assassin's Creed has been the same fucking game for the past 10 years and I just couldn't do it anymore. But that's because that's just a bad game and I don't like yeah. it and I don't want to give them their money to see how I'm going to like it because I know I'm not going to like it. And then I'm sure there's other games like that. Uh, the yeah. only other one is we didn't buy Gears of War for a while. You just don't like Gears of War. But I no, like Gears, Gears of, of... No, Gears of War I like. Uh, it was um, it was Borderlands. We Oh, we that's what I meant. It's Gearbox, yeah. Borderlands. Gearbox, yeah. Gearbox. Uh, you really don't like about. Borderlands. I actually really liked Borderlands. Yeah. Uh, but I stopped buying it because uh, the CEO is a piece of shit. Uh, yeah. But then it's like, does that even... I mean, there's still thousands of people that worked on that game, you know? Yeah. So maybe maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Yeah. But anyway, uh, (laughs) let's talk about the big update that happened today about this whole situation. (laughs) Uh, Jason Schreier uh, made a whole ass Bloomberg article about it. Yes. Bloomberg is is behind a paywall, but luckily he just tweeted the whole article. (laughs) Right. He he said, last weekend, Bayonetta's former voice actor uh, called for fans to boycott the new game, saying she was offered just $4,000 to work on it. Her Twitter videos went viral and stoked a debate over voice actor wages, but the full story is much more complicated. He goes on to say, Platinum offered Helena Taylor between $3,000 and $4,000 per session for at least five sessions, according to two people familiar with the deal and documentation viewed by Bloomberg. 
In response, the people said Taylor asked for a six-figure fee and residuals negotiations fell apart. Because if you're like not even in the same ballpark, things are just gonna, yeah. <laughs> they're just going to move on. Um, Taylor denies this account in an email to Bloomberg. She called the version of events an absolute lie and said that Platinum is trying to save their ass and the game. Taylor's videos have received more than 9.5 million views on Twitter and led to led to a deluge of calls from fans and pundits to boycott Bayonetta 3. But accounts and evidence reviewed by Bloomberg make it clear that those videos were not the whole story. Taylor's videos also led to a barrage of Twitter vitriol and harassment towards Platinum developers and new Bayonetta actor Jennifer Hale, who put out a statement saying she could not comment and subsequently retweeting a telling thread. This was weird, too. She retweeted a thread that said, I feel like critical thinking is a skill that needs to be taught on it as its own subject in school. If you hear only one side or part of one side of a story, you haven't heard the whole story and spreading misinformation and spreading an opinion based off of partial information can spread misinformation. Uh, and then Jason Schreier finally says, it's unlikely that the full story will get as much traction as, or as many eyeballs as the original Twitter videos, which in my opinion raises some interesting questions about about pleas to emotion and how information is disseminated in the social media age. Um, so we don't know what the story is, but right. It see this seems more plausible for it to be four thousand dollars per session for at least five yes. sessions. That's still that not that much, but that it's more than uh, the going rate. Yeah, so four thousand dollars a session for five sessions would have made would have mean she would have made twenty thousand dollars total for Bayonetta at minimum which, at the bare at minimum. minimum. Which yeah, it's it doesn't sound like a lot, um, but that's a pretty decent offering for you know five days of work um yeah because again like voice actors the, the idea is you book multiple roles to keep the you know revenue stream flowing as it were that um, but also like in the terms of being the main character there's a lot to prepare for yeah uh, she's been doing it for a while so she already did a lot of the preparation so uh yeah and you think they want to keep the same voice actress. So, like, yeah. she deserves more than, like, the going rate. Um, right. I don't know what fair is because I'm not in this industry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I I, I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you. But it's, it seems plausible that they offered her, what was it, $20,000 about? Yeah. And yeah. she wanted 100000 They were like, we're not in the same ballpark. This isn't going to work out. And then they just moved yeah. on. That sounds totally reasonable. Um, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know uh, if if a game like Bayonetta would ever warrant, you know, the ability to get to pay someone a hundred thousand dollars for the main role because you know these games are popular, but they're not runaway commercial successes like. Uh, Smash Brothers is, or you know, a mainline Nintendo game is. Um, they generally are, you know, on the lower end of the budgetary spectrum compared to like, you know, a, you know, Call of Duty costs like however many millions, billions of dollars to make, so they can afford to pay high-profile Hollywood actors to be in their games. Mm -hmm. A game like Bayonetta can't really do that. Um, so in her video, she claimed that Bayonetta made like an insane. The franchise made an insane amount of money. Is what she, she claimed like an astronomical number that didn't really make any sense. Yeah, because if we, if we lest we forget the original Bayonetta when that came out in two thousand and nine, that was a Sega published game for the three hundred and sixty and the PS three. The reason why. Nintendo uh, picked it up and published it is because Sega didn't want to do it anymore because it didn't make a lot of money. It was not mm -hmm. a success. And Bayonetta 2 also wasn't that big of a success because it was on the Wii U originally. <laughs> so you're dealing with a series that, yes, it has a solid fan base. Yes, they are good games, but they are not, you know, they're not making GTA numbers. They're not even making like Sonic the Hedgehog numbers at yeah. this point so 
it, it, it was it yeah it, it it's she made a lot of really strange claims and and and, yeah. and and stuff it was a very strange twitter diatribe from her i do think that uh bringing up the argument that voice actors aren't paid that much is is mm -hmm. valuable um i see a lot of people in the chat already saying that uh the wage she was offered is like great and uh uh, even the the um, I see people even saying that the, the the going rate from from the union for voice acting is is good because it's only like an hour for getting paid a couple hundred bucks for an hour of work is awesome, yeah. but like you're not get you're not working forty hours a week you know it's not it's not <laughs> yeah. like that you're you're spending a while not getting a job or working towards getting the job and doing auditions all the time and stuff so yeah. it's a skill that's very specific and. Uh, being the face of a franchise, I think, is worth a lot. What happened here to me, what I think, Helena Taylor thought she was so closely tied to Bayonetta and thought, you guys can't do this without me. I'm what makes Bayonetta Bayonetta. I want $100,000. And they said, I don't know, man. Uh, uh, Jennifer Hale just did it, and she did a great job. Yeah. And I don't think anybody's going to care if we just switch over to her, and she'll do it for like a quarter of the price, so we'll just do that. So she misread the situation completely. Yeah. If this was like a David Hayter situation where everybody associates Solid Snake with David Hayter, yeah. he could probably negotiate, you know, a, a, a high rate like that. But uh, yeah, that wasn't the case here. It makes me wonder, like, because I, I, I play Bayonetta 1. That's the extent of my Bayonetta uh, knowledge. And, you know, when I saw the trailer for Bayonetta 3, the English trailer where she speaks, it sounded like Bayon like Bayonetta. Like the, I had the no idea Bayonetta. there was Me even either. a new voice actress yeah. until this happened. Yeah. I mean, I knew Jennifer Hale had come in to replace her, but I didn't I didn't know. It sounded it sounded the same to me. <laughs> even it was also weird that they said there was scheduling con that Platinum said there were scheduling conflicts because that right. is just a lie. They just straight up <laughs> started th this whole thing started with a lie from Platinum. So that already puts them in a bad situation. Yeah. Um I mean I'm sure I'm sure they just made that up because they didn't want to say what it actually they're probably like under some contracted reason why they can't they can't talk about like pay disputes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um but it should be noted that uh Helena Taylor did break NDA to talk about this. She, she uh, yes. did break her NDA to come forward with these uh, accusations, as it were. It's really not good for her career, this whole thing. I, I, no. she, she thought she was, like, righteous and stuff, and it if, all, if this new information is true, she's l looking kind of bad. And yeah. I think it started off looking bad when she attacked the new voice actress. That, yeah. was, that was kind of messed up. So basically I mean, the moral of the story is uh, if you were interested in Bayonetta 3, don't worry about it. Just play it and see if you like it. <laughs> so Hulu is rebooting Futurama, my mm -hmm. second favorite show of all time. Um, okay. And when they announced the reboot, they said, we got every actor back except John DiMaggio, the voice of Bender, my favorite character. Yeah, he's the so, only voice actor I know. From yeah. the show. <laughs> so what happened with John DiMaggio said, I didn't sign a contract yet because they lowballed me. And I want, I deserve a better pay because I am the voice of Bender. Right. He eventually did sign on. And when somebody asked him what was the, uh, what did they finally wind up giving you? He said what they offered me originally. They did I didn't get a raise or anything. But I did that to bring attention to this issue that people just think voice actors are easily replaceable. Mm. Now, there is a there is a big difference between Hel uh, Helena Taylor, the voice actor of three of one character in two video games trying to, you know, come out and lead a revolution and John DiMaggio, who has voiced Bender since 2000. <laughs> Yeah. In across several TV shows and movies, and has also been in various other projects like uh, Adventure Time, Kim Possible, 
Gears of War. Um, someone who has like real clout and like pop culture uh, resonance for him to do something like that makes sense. He he could have gotten more if he couldn't get anywhere coming back to possibly his most iconic character. What makes uh, Taylor think she's going to be able to do the same? Yeah, I, I would also like to point. I don't want to make this a Helena Taylor Duncan session. No, no, uh, yeah. But I just looked up her IMDb. What do you think the last job she had was? Tell me it was Smash Brothers voicing Bayonetta. <laughs> Which one? Ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> Wii U. <laughs> so that means. That means they didn't even. I don't. It just says 2014 Wii U. I don't know if they brought her back to do some cleanup or if they just straight up used this. Yeah, scroll down because under archive, if it's if there's archival footage, then maybe Ultimate is under that. Ultimate, right there. (laughs) 2018. So she hasn't done fuck all. Since Smash Brothers Wii U and Bayonetta 2, which was, I guess, the same year. Yeah. Uh, and they just used archival footage for Ultimate. That's crazy. Yeah. That's that's insane. And they asked for her back, and she's like, all right, fine, 100 grand. Give it to me right yeah. now. I mean, and they're like, you, are, you haven't done any. And also, another thing I want to say, she said in the, in the video, I, they made me audition, which is because pro- she hasn't fucking done anything since 2014. I mean, they, they made her audition again, and she said, "I passed with flying colors." How do you know that? <laughs> I mean, look, making her audition is probably standard practice. A lot of studios will make returning actors mm-hmm. re-audition. That's not that's not out of the ordinary, right? I understand. Yeah, I, I'm just saying, what? Why do you think you passed with flying colors? Yeah. They were probably like, eh, it was okay. We'll offer you this much. And she's like, no, I want a hundred thousand. I'm fucking Bayonetta. And then, then they're like, well, I mean, we just had uh, 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 Jennifer Hale do it. And she sounded just as good, if not better. Yeah. And she'll do it for cheap. So we'll just do that. So this, the whole situation is very bizarre. Yeah. I, I don't know. The moral of the story is get Bayonetta if you want. Uh, somehow voice actors should get paid more. But maybe yeah. not as much as Jen- as, as Helena. Uh, uh, maybe not this wanted. Yeah, very strange game industry uh, 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 yeah. drama that we all just got caught in. Will, what is your favorite show? If if Futurama is your second, uh, The Simpsons seasons one through ten. Okay, you you, so you, Matt te- Graney- you tease the 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 chat a little bit with that one. Oh. Yeah, Mac Mac Raining created my two favorite shows of all time. So, okay, that's how it works. I thought maybe we'd see a Batman animated series up there. No, that's that's up there. But okay, I always tell people, uh, The Simpsons is my favorite show, and Futurama is my second favorite show. And it is shocking to me that Disenchantment, Mac Raining's third cartoon, is not my third favorite show. <laughs> I heard that was bad. Uh, I didn't get very far in it, and it's kind of upsetting to me that I did. Okay, you know my favorite cartoon is what is that? Two stupid dogs. Anyway, that is a good cartoon. No, I just pulled that out of my ass. <laughs> um, do we need to do a sponsor? I don't know. I didn't get a chance to email them. What do you mean? I just look at the I, email. Uh, do we have to do October? How many October spots do we have to do? How many did I, we do? Hold on, let me open up my email. So it's, it's only your job. I, I've been busy. <laughs> Will Will asks for a hundred thousand dollars to be back on the Wolf Den po- yeah. podcast. <laughs> I'm asking you to boycott the Wolf Den <laughs> podcast. Anyway, we got uh, Willow with 100 bits. In respect to the protest, I will be playing Bayonetta 3 exclusively in naive angel mode. (laughs) Uh, Is that the porn mode or the not porn mode? I forgot. Uh, I think that's the not porn mode. Mm. And then Mecha Dragon gave us 100 bits and said, are ultra wide monitors okay to use when live streaming games, Bob? I think 
there should be I, I it sounds like a feature that that sh that should exist in the wild maybe you people can help me out i can't seem to find alt an ultra wide monitor that allows you to do split screen like like an ultra wide monitor that's the size of two monitors there should be a feature to have one monitor show the display port and one monitor show an hdmi port so it's one seamless monitor and you can have two, uh, like a picture in picture like half is one display and half is the other display but from my research i haven't found a like a decent uh uh ultra wide monitor that can do that and for that reason uh i don't think ultra wides are good for streaming i think ultra wide monitors are fucking awesome and i would love to be able to use one but uh, the fact that you can't have two displays, you can't use them as two displays. So gaming usually takes up the whole screen. Or, and sometimes you even get black bars on the side of the game that doesn't support ultra wide. It's not a good situation for uh, live streaming games unless they're recognized as two separate monitors. Anyway, uh, we also got uh, Emmy with uh, who subscribed. So thank you very much for that. Samsung has some, but they cost a lot. I don't know if they come up as two monitors, though, or or if they can do the picture in picture in the way that I want side by side. I think Samsung's can. not There's a certain model of Samsung that can. I saw one on uh, two. I saw one on Amazon that said like dual picture, but it didn't act. It was a lie. It was just saying that the resolution was twice as big. And they had in the picture, they had a window that was half the size of the screen. So it made it look right. like it could do that, but it can't actually do that. Something about HDMI capacity. What I seen review videos of them. I think they said they don't something about HDMI capacity. Um, oh, they probably can't. You probably can't input the whole screen via hdmi but you're not you're not trying to do that you're trying to have hdmi just be one side of the screen picture by picture oh that's the name of the mode picture by picture that makes a lot yeah. of sense uh ultra wide picture by picture it auto filled dual controller and picture in picture how to set up picture by picture. All right, so look for that. Look for picture by picture. Thank you, bl Blar. I have an uh, Asus Ultra Wide that can do that. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I haven't seen this feature. I've been trying to find something like it. Uh, I don't think we have a sponsorship in October. Sweet. No. At all. I'm not seeing anything. No. Okay. Uh, well, then, what is the next story? Oh, the Xbox Design Lab. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm wearing my Manscaped uh, underwear right now. I could have could have pulled my pants off for this. Ah, uh, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, but yeah, instead of underpants, you can design a new controller. <laughs> Whoa. Personalize your Elite Series 2 controller with Xbox Design Lab. Whether you're looking for a custom des uh, design controller for yourself, a loved one, or a special gamer in your life, the Xbox Design Lab provides a broad canvas for your design for you for you to design the perfect controller. Since Xbox Design Lab launched in 2016, the number one fan request has been to include Elite controllers in our unique customization program to empower further personalization of our premium controller. Uh, now you have billions of colorful ways to make the most customizable controller from Xbox, unmistakably yours. Uh, we're excited to bring more choices to gamers around the world and can't wait to see how fans reimagine what it is to be elite. Uh, players can choose from a variety of different colors to customize nearly all the external parts of the Elite Series 2 controller, including the body, back case, D-pad, bumpers, triggers, thumbsticks, and buttons. You can even choose between a cross-shaped or a faceted D-pad. And for the first time ever in Xbox Design Lab, color customize the thumbstick base and ring. Further personalization for, uh, 
Further personalize your design with laser engraving to add your name tag, gamer tag, or our custom or any custom 16 character message. The best part is that the Elite Series 2 controllers are designed to be fully customizable with interchangeable components so you can play with a specific setup that works best for you. Choose the right components to unleash your best game such as metallic paddles and different shaped thumbsticks. Add a custom add a custom design carrying case to match your style and keep the controller and components secure and organized. Mix and match colors on different parts until settling on a design that is uniquely yours and have it shipped right to your door. Uh, so this is a big deal because it's the Elite controller now. Yes. Uh, like they said, this has been the number one request for Design Lab, and they're finally uh, they're finally giving it to you. Uh, and it's cool because it's it's customizable in what you get as well as you know making everything a different color. Uh, starting at one forty nine ninety nine US dollars, des- uh, design the perfect controller for your collection with with all the premium Elite Series two features. You can buy and personalize individual Elite accessory packs to pair with your uh, Series two controller, or you can get the controller with the Elite components for a two hundred uh, for two hundred and ten US dollars. So you can customize the controller. You can customize the components. You can buy them separately, or you can get the whole kit and caboodle all at once. So this is what we this is what we wanted from the very beginning from yes. Design Lab. Yes. Uh, so I got one. I'm not getting you one. <laughs> Fuck you. They're too oh. expensive. They're too goddamn expensive. Last time I got three of the of the fancy uh, Design Lab controllers. This yeah. time I'm just getting one because it's two hundred and twenty freaking dollars. Yeah. Um, Will, I also forwarded to you. We do have to do Manscaped sponsors. Um, okay, this video is sponsored by. No, wait, oh, I will do. Oh, I will do it after this. Um, oh, I was looking at the wrong email chain. God damn it! I, I don't think you even got that. Did you get that one? I got. I just forwarded to you. I don't even think they even okay. sent it to you. No, I, yeah, I, I literally just got it. <laughs> okay, so this is what I got. I got uh, uh, uh so I don't like how you can't change the color of the grips. That really bothers. Yeah, me. that that. Uh, that severely limits what you actually can do with the controller. Yeah, I want to uh I want to bring up a thread from from cuz I when this was announced, I tweeted about it. Uh I tweeted about it and I said uh uh I'm hoping Elite controllers would come I, I was hoping Elite controllers would come to Design Lab. I just hope the options are not as limiting as the video would suggest because when they showed the initial video, they just showed black buttons and and black grip and they just showed the faceplate changing color. And I was like, that's not very exciting at all. That's not very design labby. That's just literally picking a color like for the faceplate. That's stupid. And then Xbox responded and they said, there will be more to customize than tease here. We'll share more closer to the holidays. So I actually went back to look at this tweet because I was like, they lied. (laughs) <laughs> There's, but but no, they didn't really lie. They were just talking no. about the buttons. Like yeah. like there is a lot more customization than that original video led on. However, I will say I'm disappointed you can't change the grips. The grips, yeah, there should be grip colors. Maybe I think Kevin Kenson brought up that the grips might uh, get get shitty if there are different colors, or like or like the material that the grip is made out of might not handle different colors well. Yeah, so that's possible. Uh- isn't the white Elite Series Two controller also have black grips, or am I making that up? Yes, no, you're right. So, so the okay. they uh, when they announced the Design Lab, they also announced that they were making a Core Elite controller, yeah, which is just a white Elite controller that has no extra stuff, like no extra thumbsticks, uh, no extra D pad, uh, no extra back paddles, no case, which I think is great because it makes the Elite controller cheaper. And yep. it's great to be launched alongside this because it makes it so you can get a cheaper Elite controller. Honestly, uh, I would have just wanted back paddles. If it were, Actually, I think I, you can. You can just add back paddles. Because I did, right? Did I do that? Thank you. Uh, where are they? No, I think if you get the accessory pack, you get the whole thing. 
No, you do, but I th I remember picking the colors of just the back paddles. Where is that part? Uh, if Bumpers you scroll down, and triggers. It say accessories. Isn't there a thing that says next accessories at the bottom? Oh, it is. Oh, okay. So I don't like that. I wish yeah. that uh, the... Can you just get the back paddles? No, I think you have to get the no, whole I accessory you... pack. Uh, hold on a second. Because I think you can select. Because right I'm now, add-ons, $10. So I've, I fucked up here. I got the whole thing, yep. the whole package with the case and everything. Because I, I want it. Because it's kind of cool. You could get the color of the case and stuff. But I didn't realize under the thumbstick and D-pad pack, if you scroll down... Oh, it's not even doing it for me right now. Oh, that's Wait, why, why I didn't it... realize it. Why is yours $219? I don't know. Because <laughs> if you do the whole package, it's supposed to only be $209. Uh, oh, because I added the, 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 the wolf den text. Oh, uh, okay. I gotcha. So this is where I fucked up, I think, because if you go under thumbstick and D-pad, you can add a D-pad here, or, or, or you know, the 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 cool style D-pad, uh, and you can just pick the metal. But then the thumbstick, why can't I choose the color of the thumbstick? I did it before. You can, uh, it's thumbstick topper. That's what you. Yeah, there's nothing under it, for me. Well, that that is weird. Yeah, there's I nothing don't there. Know. Very strange, but I was able to do yeah. it before. I, I went back. I didn't realize that was like that, and then I came back yeah. later, and I saw I was able to change it. But uh, I'm getting black thumbsticks, uh, okay. so that's a little that's a little disappointing. Yeah, what's this about now? Uh, save. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a little. This part's a little confusing. It is a little, yeah. But I think you know once once you play around with it, once you like select your options, it starts to make more sense. I really just wanted the like if if I wasn't gonna make a video on this, I would literally just get the uh, back paddles. I don't want all that other stuff. Maybe the case. The case is very nice. Yeah. Uh, but I think you know even with the black grips, I think this looks great. The one that I put together here. Yeah. No, it's very. I think you know it is very nice. Uh, I did notice that not all the color options are available for all the components, um, because I wanted to make like a New York Islander style controller because I'm that guy. Um, but there's two types of oranges. There's soft orange and zest orange. Zest orange is like a deeper color. And mm -hmm. you can't use um, zest orange for the buttons or the thumbsticks or the D-pad or anything like that. And that like can screw up your whole, the whole look of your controller. Oh, I see that. Soft orange is the face. Yeah. Yeah, you can't do zest orange for the for the face, which is annoying. Yeah. But I so when the design lab first launched with the original uh uh just regular old design of of, of the yeah. controller, there weren't a lot of options. And yeah. uh well, I mean there were a decent amount of options, I should say. They added a lot more options down the line, so there are there is potential that they will add a lot more options to this as well. So, mm -hmm. I wouldn't uh say it's all lost here so if if you're kind of on the fence maybe wait a little bit for them to have more options uh but if you are in the market for an elite controller i think this is the best way to do it because you get a little personalized yeah. one yeah a and of course you I mean, don't have to get this type of d-pad you can get the the fancier d-pad if you want so if you just if you're just getting the controller you get to pick the type of d-pad you want if you get the bundle you can get the other kind of d-pad included right 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 so I'll try to have a video on that. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, it's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, people are uh, scoffing at the price. Elite controllers are expensive. Yeah. This is like uh, a regular price for an Elite controller. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of pro controllers like this are expensive. Yes. Um, speaking of which, the PlayStation 5 DualSense Edge has gotten its price and a release date. 
Yes. Uh, the, so I, I want to know which came first because <laughs> uh, they were both tweeted a, around the exact same time. So I saw the Microsoft news first. So Microsoft tweeted it at 9.24 a.m. Right. So let's see when PlayStation tweeted it. Yeah, I saw the Design Lab update first. So I assume that that was first. PlayStation tweeted at 9.01 a.m. Ooh, they were they were first by by just a few minutes. Interesting. Basically, like fifteen minutes, they were they were they were first. <laughs> Very weird. Very. I wonder if Microsoft forced it out. No, they couldn't have. <laughs> no, no, I, like because Design Lab's like a big deal. That's like an actual like, you know, user interface, and like they got to get the. You know, it's made to order, so they got to make sure the factory is able to start making these orders right away. Yeah, and PlayStation did press even, release. Yeah, it's just a press release, and the, I don't even think it's you can pre-order it. Uh, I think you can. Pre-orders for the controller and replaceable stick modules will be available starting as early as next Tuesday. Oh, uh, yeah, October twenty-fifth. So it's not pre-orderable yet. Yeah. Well, anyway, today we've, uh, we're have pleased to share that the DualSense Edge wireless controller, the first ever ultra-customizable controller developed by PlayStation, will launch globally on January 26th. Built with high performance and personalization in mind, the DualSense Edge wireless controller for PS5 invites you to craft your own unique gaming experiences through custom controls tailored to your playstyle. And they have a nice little video. The DualSense oh, Edge wireless controller... What was that? I wasn't looking at the video. I completely right. ignored it. Uh, the DualSense Edge wireless controller will be available for the recommended retail price of two hundred US dollars, of uh, twenty nine thousand nine hundred eighty yen, including tax, um, two hundred and thirty nine euros and two hundred and nine British pounds. In addition. Replaceable stick modules will be available globally on January 26th for the recommended retail price of twenty dollars American, um, twenty six hundred yen, uh, twenty five euros and twenty pounds. Uh, pre-orders for the controller and replaceable modules will be available starting as early as next Tuesday, October twenty fifth, at select retailers. So be sure to check your local uh, reseller. Yeah, that sounds about right. These like yeah. professional controllers are gonna cost. A- decent amount of money yeah playstation's uh, very far behind here because they are just at the original they are basically just doing what the original leaf controller did and that was yeah. that came out a long time ago <laughs> i mean it's it's got completely replaceable analog sticks which is neat that is good that um, is very it cool. has the the enhanced features of a normal dual sense controllers, like the adaptive triggers and the gyro and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, yeah, it's, it's got different back paddles. I don't know if you've noticed that it, ha- it has two back paddles and then it has like, I guess they're like buttons that you could swap them out for. Yeah. It's got these like weird nubs. little like nubs, yeah. but, but it's still only two back paddles, right? Instead of yeah. the four that the elite controller has. Yeah. Cause the elite controller, that's uh licensed by scuff that design oh I didn't know yeah that. interesting i think playstation should have, oh wait no they do have that okay this is the coolest part adjustable trigger stops and dead zones mm-hmm. so you can basically give yourself like hair triggers because that's my least favorite yeah. thing about the playstation controller like i like that they have adaptive triggers but most games don't give you the option to just have hair triggers instead uh yeah so forcing it to have a hardware hair trigger is is awesome. Uh I do think it's cool. There's one thing they have. It's a it's a connector hauser where you when you connect the USB C cable to the controller, it like basically locks the, the cable in place. That's, to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. I don't know how I feel about that. Th- that is cool if you play at a desk. It is dangerous if you play on a couch. Yeah, like I don't I'd rather it just break away if I'm 
hole in it, you know? Like, I yeah. don't know the, I don't know if I ever need something like that to lock. That seems weird. It's a weird thing to lock. Yeah. I guess the hope is that it would break away from the system. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't look like it's designed to break away. That's really, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I would never yeah. use that. <laughs> Seems extremely <laughs> dangerous. Um, but it comes to the case. It's cool. I'm, I'm glad PlayStation yeah. is on board with the Elite Controller train now because, uh, uh, you know me, I'm into fancy controllers. Yes. So this <laughs> comes out January 26th. Mm-hmm. Uh... We got some more notifications here. We got Thorian Dorf with 10 months. Hi, bros. Hello. Hello. We got Superstar with a Prime. Thank you very much. And we got Mimi Memes with 27 months. Haven't caught a podcast or stream live in a bit. Apparently long enough for Bob's beard to get luscious. Thanks, dude. <laughs> missed, missed you, bros. Thanks for your work and company. Well, thank you, Mimi Memes, for thank you. watching. Thank you so much. And admiring the beard. Yes. Uh, you know what else is really well, hairy? <laughs> you guys want to see? I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say, I really, I can't afford these controllers as is. But luckily, thanks to Manscaped, maybe I can. Oh, <laughs> this video is sponsored shoot. by Manscaped. Apparently, uh, <laughs> uh, hold on. Now let me open up the thing. Oh, don't worry. I gotta open up my elevator music that I play during these. Uh, hot. Uh, it says Q haunted music. Michael Myers oh. sure is scary, but the last thing you need uh, is to be hairy this Halloween. Luckily, our friends at Manscaped launched their fourth generation performance package to make sure that your pumpkins get the ultimate carving experience on this spooky day. Uh, turn your bite sized treatment into a king size candy and join the six million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the code WOLFDEN. Make the right call this spooky season. It's trick or trim. Or both, oh. really. You do both. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, mostly gentlemen, the Performance Package 4.0 comes in the Shed travel bag, uh, which uh, I don't know if you know this, but all their products are named after uh, gardening equipment. And as a dad, I appreciate that. They're, That's good. Uh, yes. <laughs> of course, their main attraction is the Lawnmower 4.0, easily the greatest ball trimmer on the planet, their words, and mine. Uh, of, cor of course, has a ceramic blade uh, to reduce the risk of nicks and cuts, uh, LED lights so that you can see in the, in the dark. If you shave in the dark, you shouldn't shave in the dark. Don't do that. Uh, it is it is waterproof, so you can use it in the shower and over the sink. Uh, like I said, helps reduce the risk of nicks, ingrown hairs, and other various grooming accidents. But that's not all. Cause oh, it's a copyrighted have... song that I'm playing. It's copyrighted. Oh, no. No, no more spooky. It's back to royalty-free <laughs> elevator music. All right. Well, were you playing the Halloween theme? I, it was just a spooky. I just typed in spooky lounge music. <laughs> I just played whatever. Uh, great uh what else is great the weed whacker uh nose and ear uh ear and nose hair trimmer uh as an old man i could tell you this becomes more and more important every day and it's just as nice just as gentle on you as the lawnmower is on your balls uh but this goes in your ear and your nose imagine so, sticking a whole razor in your ear or your nose not fun not fun. Now you have not a special device just for that. Yeah. Uh, and not only do they make those, they also make uh, Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. I need some of that today. Crop Reviver Ball Toner. Because let me tell you, it's, stuff stinks down there after a while. And you forget that you need to clean it. So having I, this on uh, listen, hand is a good reminder. I don't know about forgetting to clean it. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's important to clean it. Yes, Maybe throughout absolutely. the day you need a little refresher. You don't have time to take a whole shower, you know? Yeah. Uh, hey, you want to see my underwear? Yes. Also, too, it comes with a nice underwear that is very comfortable and, and you know, holds you, it holds you in place all it day long. It holds me in place. Yes. That is true. Otherwise, who knows what's going to happen? Yes. 
Uh, so yes, yeah, like we like we said many times on this podcast, the uh, the Manscaped Performers Package 4.0 is a great deal. It comes with uh, some of the best men's grooming products out there today. Uh, the Lawnmower 4.0, of course, magnificent trimmer for your nutsack. Uh, the Weed Whacker for your ear and nose. Uh, the Crop Reviver and uh, Crop Preserver for keeping it toned down there. And the underwear, because why not? And the Shed Travel Bag to keep it all in nice, one nice, one nice place. So is it 20% yeah. off and 20% free shipping? Off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Uh, manscaped.com. Use the code WOLFDEN. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code WOLFDEN. Say trick or treat to your beautiful new Halloweenie with Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. Who said Halloweenie? Was it them or you? It was them. It was in the call okay. to action. Interesting. Okay. Sorry about the detour. Yeah. I have to pay some have, bills around here. Yeah, I, got, I need to afford an elite controller. <laughs> I did make a nice one that looked that's like Robin the Boy Wonder theme that I kind of kind of think I might. Interesting. Yeah. We got more notifications during that ball talk. We got uh <laughs> uh where am I? Uh we got War Machine with three months. Hey Bob and Will, how you doing? I'm good. How Hi. are you? That was it. I thought we got more, but that was it. Okay. Uh, all right. Where are we now? I'm so lost. Oh, let's talk about the Razor's Edge, which I pre-ordered on Saturday. Okay. So this, on Saturday, Razor tweeted this. The Razor Edge is the ultimate Android gaming handheld powered by the exclusive Snapdragon G3X Gen 1 built with an active cooled gaming chipset and 144 hertz AMOLED display. Enjoy unbeatable gaming performance. Comes with a Razer Kishi version 2 Pro. Reserve one now. So this Only was available in the US. <laughs> only available. Yeah, then they tweeted again. Only <laughs> available in the US. Oopsies. So... This is cool. This is uh, Razer. Uh, we, we, this was we. They teased this for a while. They were gonna make a handheld similar to all these other handhelds we've seen. It's made for Android gaming, but specifically for streaming, just mm -hmm. like the Logitech G Cloud, which we've talked about. But this particular one will be powerful enough to play games on it, which is really cool. Yes. However. I'm very disappointed by this by by this uh, footage that we see. I thought it was going to be a dedicated handheld device, but it looks like it's just a glorified cell phone <laughs> with a Razer Kishi slapped on the sides, which you can just do with any cell phone. Well, I think because it's you can play games directly from it. The phone part, as it were, is probably tailor-made specifically to play games natively on the device. Whereas if you were to just get like any old Android phone, it's not going to be you know, optimized to play uh, the games you would want to play on a device like this. So, so this would be cheaper than just getting an Android phone specifically for playing games on and then slapping some Razer Kishi on there? However... Uh... People who would want to do this would probably have an Android phone already and just slap some Razer Kishi yeah. on it anyway. So it's uh, I think it's a harder sell. I, I think it's really strange to to make it detachable. Like the Switch makes sense to make detachable Joy-Con because they're motion controls and you can use yeah. them as individual controllers. It's like a versatile piece of technology. This, yeah. there's no reason to detach the screen. If it's a dedicated unless, gaming device, why would they let the screen be detached? It's very unless weird. Unless they plan on letting you use other controllers for this. Like maybe Razer will do a Kishi version 3 or you know, a, a different kind of controller altogether that's still compatible with this device. You know, that's the only thing I can think of. Or maybe, you know, they're thinking you can use the Kishi you already own for this and they'll just sell the screen separately that would be cool like I, yeah 
it's bizarre to me that they would uh, have they they they'd base the whole thing basically on the Razor Kishi version too because like the back of the Kishi like form fits to different phones, right? So like I don't want to do that. I don't want to form fit it to anything but this. I'm buying it with this. Like why can't it just be for this? Like I, I'm yeah. and also I'd rather have the Razor Jungle Cat, which is a case that you put the it's 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 sleeker than this. The, 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 yeah. the Kishi's cool. I actually kind of really like the Kishi when it's going onto a phone. But if I'm only going to have one device, I think the Jungle Cat might be a little better because it just snaps right in. So even if you just put rails on the side for the Jungle Cat, I don't understand why you couldn't just do that. I, th- I think this design is already not looking too good. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's interesting that they went this route. Yeah. Uh, all that being said, I pre-ordered it anyway because it, it'll yeah. make for a good video. Uh, and I actually kind of really like Android gaming. I think this would be a great emulation device. Uh, mm-hmm. I just wish it wasn't. I wish it was just one unit and not uh, two separate units. I'm very confused why they they went this route. Why they basically made a phone and then slapped controllers on the side. I'm sure there's some convoluted reason for it. Yeah, and we'll find out when we when we mm-hmm. go into a full video review. Again, I like the Razer Kishi. I just think I'd I'd rather have a dedicated handheld if I'm buying this thing. The screen's almost seven inches, six point eight inches. Uh, yeah, full HD. And how much is it? I forgot. Um, I freaking pre-ordered it, and I forgot how much it is. <laughs> I think I only put five dollars down. That's yeah. That's not a lot. <laughs> Did I don't know if they ever said how much it's gonna be. I put five dollars down, and mm. I don't know how much I'm gonna be paying later. <laughs> well, that's concerning. No Where's wait, I think there's um price. I hold on. I saw a chart on their website, and, and I gotta wait for everything to load back. You up. mean to tell me this is the first device they decided to call the Razor Edge? I feel like that's wrong. Razor Blade. Those are was, the computers. Was the laptop? Yeah. Yeah. So I forgot they they're partnering with uh, with Verizon here. Yes. Uh, for a five G version. Uh, the five G version's price will was not yet announced. The Wi Fi wow. only model comes with a price tag of four hundred dollars. Yes. And five hundred dollars for the Founders Edition, which includes the Razer Hammerhead True Wireless Earbuds. Okay, I do not want that i don't need a founder's edition these um, head, these earbuds look like absolute dog shit <laughs> are these the ones i didn't put it in the keep because i didn't think it was a big deal but razor's making earbuds for xbox and playstation they made an xbox one and the playstation one and the xbox one will actually work on both systems whereas the playstation one will only work on playstation you are correct there you go so the Xbox One will work on both systems, I'm assuming, because it's Bluetooth. Yeah. And the PlayStation One is probably using some sort uses of a, dedicated... It uses a dongle, yeah. Oh, uh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you should get the... play If you want to use it for PlayStation, you should get the one that's dedicated for PlayStation. Right, but if you own both consoles, get the Xbox One. Right, right. And if you want to bounce back and forth, yeah, get the yeah. Xbox one. Uh, or just don't get them at all because they look like stupid headphones. How about that? <laughs> uh, okay, so I'll be testing that. Let's see how it is. I also, uh, this is not a story, but um, I saw people were getting the Logitech G Cloud, and I was curious why that was. Maybe they get they got review units or something. So I went to go check at the status of my order, and it just says it was the order has been received and that's it uh there's no uh release date or anything uh i found logitech officially said it's released in october and i found some article that said it released today from microsoft so hmm i don't i have no idea when the g cloud is is being released um 
Anyway, we can move on. Okay. To, uh, G4. Uh, G4 gets shut down <gasps> again. Uh, Comcast oh, no. is shutting down G4 after attempting to relaunch the gaming channel last year. Uh, the channel first appeared on linear cable back in 2002 until it met its demise as the final studio shows were axed in 2012 and eventually replaced by the Esquire network. Dave Scott, the CEO of Comcast, a spectator division, uh, announced the shutdown in an internal memo obtained by deadline before it was even sent uh, saying that the channel has had low viewership and has not achieved sustainable financial results. According to tweets from several people who worked at G4, uh, they learned about the shutdown from the initial press reports and tweets before receiving Scott's message directly. This is certainly not what we hoped for, and as a result, we have made the very difficult decision to discontinue G4's operations effective immediately, Scott writes. Uh, G4 made its return last year on several networks, including Comcast and uh, Xfinity, uh, Verizon Fios, Cox, and uh, Philo. Uh, it debuted with shows like Attack of the Show, X-Play, and Ninja Warrior in an attempt to pander to the nostalgia of viewers who, turned, who tuned into the network two decades ago. The company also had a multi-year agreement with Twitch, uh, where it hosted occasional streams before its return to linear television. Scott adds that the company's human resources team will reach out to staffers on the G4 team to discuss uh, other opportunities that may be available. Uh, what did you think about the return of G4? Because uh, I, 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 I think I was pretty vocal about how I think that uh, it was v very strange to try to revive this franchise. It seemed like uh, a desperate move by Kevin Pereira to, to <laughs> hold on to his career. <laughs> yeah. Uh, once it actually debuted and I, like, I started seeing like the live streams they were doing and, uh, how they handled X play coming back and things like that. I, I liked the content that they were making. I just, I feel like their downfall was trying to still be a television network dedicated yes. to video games in the year of our Lord 2022 when 95 at or higher percent of uh, video game entertainment content is online. G4 yes. could have been the best video game variety YouTube channel. I'd like to point out that that was almost my exact words. This business model would have been near impossible to sustain it in the year of our Lord 2022. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Um. Yeah, had this just stayed as a YouTube channel, I mean, I don't know if the money would have been the same, but I we would have seen it for uh, last much longer than it did. I think trying to make it a TV network again, uh, is trying to capture a lightning in a bottle that you'll never you'll never see. But it soon. it was it was kind of a weird like half-assed TV channel. It was like. You were half into like the 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 new media, and half yeah. in the old media, and that just didn't work that way. Like they had show, they had a Twitch channel, they had a bunch of shows on there, they had shows on yeah. YouTube, but they also had a TV channel. Did they bring it back to TV? Yeah, they had. They were on TV. They were on terrestrial TV. Uh, Comcast, Verizon, and like a few others. Yeah. So I don't. I think these days, people who want gaming content, they're, they know we're already used to consuming it from the internet. Back in the day, yeah. internet video was was uh, kind of hard to come by, and and we we uh, didn't have like a like a dedicated source for that. So um, it was difficult to consume content. But uh, yeah. so so having a channel that was video game centric was awesome. Uh, but uh, it's been so many years. Like we all figured it out. We all are just on the internet yeah. now. So why wouldn't we we do that? Plus, it's be it, it's it's better than it was. Now you can you have uh if you want to watch a show, you have a whole dedicated YouTube channel for that one show. So yeah. why would I sit through all of the other bullshit that G four has? Like 
We only watched like what X play and and Attack of the Show. That's yeah. it. They had a bunch of other shit, but who cared about that? <laughs> and I should note that like yeah, G four has its own YouTube channel, but so does X play and Attack of the Show. Yeah. So I would just subscribe to those channels if I wanted. To. So Attack of the Show had a weird situation because that that died with G4 on broadcast yeah. television. And then Kevin Pereira made like a Twitch channel and like made The Attack, which was a, a, a spiritual successor to Attack of the Show. And he had like basically a mini me. It was like another guy that was like yeah. a co-host that was just exactly him, but like a younger version of him. And uh, they did skits, and they basically made it exactly like Attack of the Show. Um, but it, and they ran it like a TV channel. So they had people working on it. They had producers and stuff, and 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 people behind the scenes working on it, and kind of cameramen and stuff, and a set. Yeah. And uh, it was a Twitch channel. So like, that's it was not sustainable. Uh, the viewership fell off, and uh, they, you know, he, they had to pay people. There were people working on this. So in a desperate plea, uh, Kevin Pereira. View botted his own Twitch channel and yeah. <laughs> uh, and admitted to it and was like, "I listen. I had people to pay. I I and we had sponsors and I I wanted them to you know keep supporting it. So we had to make it look like we were uh, doing good. Um, and I understand that desperation. Uh, so that had to go away and it went away. And then somehow he acquired him and whoever else acquired the rights to revive G four. Um, yeah." And they did, and 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 that uh, first video where they all walk into the offices was so fucking bizarre to me because it was like they filmed like Kevin Pereira and then like Adam Sessler and and uh, uh, Xavier Woods like walking into the office and everybody cheering them, and I was yeah. like, I was like, what? Why the fuck are all the employees cheering? their bosses walking into the office that seems very strange that seems like it was very set up and weird yeah um and then they and then they ran it they had a bunch of people working for them and it just i guess wasn't profitable and it was shut down by comcast yeah they are they comcast owns g4 mm -hmm. uh i think i think the the idea to revive g4 came from uh I'm trying to find the guy's name who was like he was it was like a top he was like a top guy at comcast but he was also like the son of somebody who was even higher mm -hmm. up at comcast i think kevin Pereira had a lot to do with it well he i think he was he was campaigning really hard well yeah because it's the only thing he was ever known for but he also quit like a few weeks ago before the announcement of the shutdown i i so, think he had authority and knew what was happening and that's probably yeah. why that happened i also think gerard took on like a leadership role there too the completionist i think he yeah he had, things started to go south a long time ago and i think that he kind of uh, uh yeah tried to like help as much as he could but there's only so much you could do and this is, they had a lot of great people working there. They had freaking Gerard, they had Will Neff, they had uh, Fiona Nova. They had like a lot of great people like, yeah. like doing content for them. Uh, I just don't think that sort of thing is is sustainable these days. Yeah, no, it, I the idea was there, but the execution was wrong. They, they tried to do 2020 to uh, 2002, execution in 2022 yeah and it's just not compatible yeah I, I i think the way to go for all of these people is just do your own shit and like it's yeah. so it's it's too easy these days to just turn a camera on yourself and hit record so yeah all of these people need to produce their own content and and, and especially if they're trying to be on twitch it's literally the easiest way to just throw content out there online People are yeah. watching G4. I mean, there's people who are watching for the name G4, but they are staying for the personalities. And you can put that, per it's, it's your personality. Put it out there on your own without having a corporate overlord telling you whether or not you can go to work that day. Yeah. Everybody who worked at G4 found out from the press release that they were no longer employed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 
that's sad and unfortunate. I hope they got uh some some bonuses for or like a safety net or something. Anyway. Yeah. Uh it's a little sad for the people who worked there, but I mean it's Yeah. I I could have seen this coming from a mile away. It was just never yeah. gonna gonna work out for them. It doesn't help that zero percent of the new generation watches cable. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. That yeah. I I didn't even freaking know it was a TV channel. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it was only a TV channel and like five cable providers, and there was a lot more yeah. than that in this country. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, back in the day when G4 was a big deal, it was hard to find video game content. Yes. There, there was some there you could find it on the internet, but the internet video was in its infancy. Mm -hmm. I thought this was really cool. This is a fun little side. I found this on the uh, Nintendo subreddit. Uh, they found the oldest Nintendo video on YouTube. Uh, it's a little different because the 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 top post, the original post, is not the oldest video. It was found in the comments. Uh, <laughs> This is L is real. It's got no audio. It's from August 27th, 2005. Jeez. So it's one of the first videos on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, and it only has 800,000, uh, 300,000 views. Uh, this is, remember the whole rumor in Mario 64 that um, mm -hmm. you could play as Luigi? Yeah, the, the rumor was that something about this sign here, it's completely unintelligible, and we still don't know what it means to this day. Uh, this sign here says something about a Luigi or something, and you can find him somewhere in this garden. Um, and this is a video of Luigi, or, or somebody playing as Luigi in Super Mario 64. The f there's screen tearing and it's hot garbage and it's yeah. very obviously a ROM hack and it's not real. Yeah. But this is what we were working with back in the day. If we saw this, we would have been like, holy shit, how do we, how do I get that? Um, this also doesn't even look like the, uh, Luigi that we found later that was actually, yeah. uh, going to be part of Mario 64. Uh, you could see his like face. It's just Mario, but he's got like a weirdly squished face. Yeah. Uh, and he's just running uh, around. L is real 2401. That's what the sign is supposed to say? That's what yes. people thought the sign said? Yeah. Yeah, even with high-res textures, I think we still don't even know what the, what the hell that uh, sign says. Yeah. But uh, uh, the previous uh, assumption for the oldest video was this one, which was uh, December 2005, and this is uh, just a guy uploading his jump to the roof of the castle with no stars. Which is, like, you know, to be fair, impressive. Yeah, it's, he kind of just, like, glitches up to the roof. But, like, back in yeah. 2005, I would have been like, holy shit, you mean you could do that? And then I would have tried to yeah. do it. This would have been really cool. So this is, like, a real uh, video. Yeah. So L is real 247. The conspiracy theory was... That there were that meant that there were two hundred two thousand four hundred and one uh gold coins in the game. And if you can collect all of them, uh if you can collect every single one of them, it would unlock Luigi. Uh that is not true. And fun fact, one of those coins is actually unobtainable without the use of hacking. So it is actually impossible to collect every single gold coin in the game. Mm -hmm. But uh according to the uh, video game Easter egg uh, wiki on Ju July 25th, 2020, which was 24 years and one month after the, the release of Mario 64, source code was leaked, which, in the, which includes an unedited model of Luigi. So the Giga leak happened 24 years and one month after the release of Mario 64. Now, did that and Giga that, leak have a high res text? Did, did, yes. that, we knew that it had Luigi in it because I, I yeah, that had took high, it and that, I used it was, in Mario. That was the leak that had the high res texture of Luigi. No, no, no. But I'm asking, did it have a high res texture of the fucking sign? 
Oh, a sign. <laughs> Do we know what the stupid sign says? Is here it says it says Eternal Star, but we don't know. It doesn't really look like it says that. Uh, I think it's supposed to say Eternal Star, and then some other crap under it. Yeah, we don't know. We don't. We we. I guess we still don't know what it says. I think it's supposed to say Eternal Star. That's but I, I that's not confirmed. That's just somebody is taking the font from Super Mario sixty four and putting it next to the blur. And saying it looks kind of the same. <laughs> we don't have an actual like uh, like texture of before it got bit crushed like that. Right. Anyway, uh, more notifications. We got Hanuma K1 with two months who says, "Hey, Wolf Bros, just stopping by to give my Prime sub. Unfortunately, past my bedtime, so I'll catch the archive on YouTube tomorrow. Thank you very much for stopping Thank by. You. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night." A volcanic puppy with two months. Wolf Bros, hello, Wolf Bros. Love the content. Thanks for being Thank here you. and watching. Uh, all right. More news. Uh, analog announcements. Whoa. They announced uh, three things on October 16th. Uh, pocket pre-orders, pocket cartridge adapters, and news about the Super NT and Mega SG. Uh, oh, pocket pre-orders. 95% of all pocket pre-orders, uh, group B and C, will begin shipping in October and through the, the end of the year. The small amount of remaining orders will ship in 2023 as soon as possible. We will begin shipping Group B and then Group C in orders chronologically. Um, you can view your fulfillment status on the order status page, which was sent in the email confirmation of your pre-order. Your status will be on one of the following. Pending. Uh, your order is waiting fulfillment. Please check back for more information. Uh, preparing. Your order is ready to ship. If you need to change your address or wish to cancel, please do so in the time frame stated on your order status page. Um, processing. Your order is now with uh, our fulfillment partner and will be sent to you shortly. Please note that once it once an order is processing, uh, we cannot accept any address changes or cancellation. Uh, we will email you when your order is being prepared and, uh, and allow the address changing and order cancellation. Please do not email us inquiring when your order will ship to change your address or to cancel as it will slow down fulfillment and customer service. Um, so if you pre-ordered a analog pocket and you're still waiting for it, it's coming. It's actually coming, guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is a huge deal. Uh, I was yeah. worried about this because... Uh... You know, uh, Steam Deck did such a good job. They, they, yes. uh, they, they're, they basically, we thought that they were going to have uh, shortages for a long time, but they figured it out. And now if you buy a Steam Deck, you can just get one. And Analog's finally figuring it out. They can, they're catching up and, and it's exciting yeah. because now it's turned into basically an emulation machine. You could just, yes, you could play basically anything just right off of the uh, micro SD card. Yes. So uh, I'm very happy that yes anybody can uh, soon. Basically, you're you're gonna get yours very soon, and you'll be able to uh, to enjoy the ROMs off of the off of the SD card. But that's oh not all, because if you don't like to play games off of an SD card, uh, the pocket cartridge adapters uh, will be available for pre order at a hundred dollars on October twenty first. Shipping in Q3 of 2023. Sign up for stock notifications here to be emailed as soon as they are available. A pocket cartridge adapter set includes three cartridge adapters that support several systems. One adapter supports TurboGrafx-16, PC Engine, and Super Graphics uh, games. One adapter supports Neo Geo Pocket Color and Neo Geo Pocket Cartridge games. And the final adapter... Uh, supports atari lynx cartridges so it's a set of three adapters one for uh turbo graphics games one for neo geo pocket games and one for atari lynx games for a hundred dollars so we didn't have those cartridges at all before right uh no we I, had we had the 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 game, game gear. gear one that's it yes and it launched with game gear they had announced that they were planning on doing these systems right but uh, no news on when that would actually happen. Now we know. Uh, you can pre-order it October 21st. They will ship 
in Q3 next year, but uh, now we have a firm information on it. So if you're waiting for your analog pocket, this is good news. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, not news about the analog pocket, but uh, the Super NT, which is their Super Nintendo console, and the Mega SG, their Sega Genesis console, um, they will begin making one final run of the Super NT and Mega SG. Pre-orders will be available at uh, $200 on October 28th. Shipping uh, Q4 2023. Uh, sign up for stock notifications on our store to be emailed as soon as they are available. So if you missed out on getting a Mega SG or a Super NT, uh, this is your last chance to get one. God damn it. I know. I This, is, I, this is the part I of the video. Get... Yes, you should get a, a Super NT. Why? That, because. I can't make a video out of it. <laughs> You no, you can't. But if you ever need to do something with a Super Nintendo, it would mu be much easier for you to play it with this than it would to hook up a Super Nintendo to whatever upscaler nonsense that you have, because it's HDMI. Mm -hmm. You're not wrong. No, unless our good friends at at uh, uh, Eon do something. Yes, I I think the um. The thing they made for the N64 technically works on the Super Nintendo. You have to but I don't know if modify it, it, it in any way. I, yeah, I don't know if it fits properly. They might have to make a, a slight adjustment. Yeah. I do want to get a uh, fight pad for the Super Nintendo. So I, I am interested in Super... But, you know, I have the... T I'm, I don't... I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> <laughs> I have we got the Mega SG and it's awesome. Yes. Still sitting in the box, never touched it. Uh uh. Anyway. But if you are if you need a super NT viewers, uh get on it. <laughs> yeah, or just get an analog pocket and play and use play ROMs. <laughs> yeah, or do that. It's FPG. Or 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 just mod a Vita. Or just mod a Vita. <laughs> uh, anyway, we got more news like this. Scammers make yes. Switch game bestseller. Oh, let me get, let me, I don't know anything about this. Let me guess. They made it for sale for $2. Uh, no. Uh, let's see here. Price tourism, the scummy practice where people spoof their location to take advantage of emerging economies in the poorest parts of the world isn't exactly looked fondly upon in the games industry. Picking up a full price game for a buck fifty by pretending you're in Brazil both rips off the developers and damages the economies of the country being uh, e-invaded. But in a weird twist, publisher extraordinaire Mike Rose uh, just revealed uh, how it helped boost his latest game to an unexpected level of success. No More Robots is the publisher of many successful indie projects with names under its belt like Yes, Your Grace, uh, Hypnospace Outlaw, and Descenders. Uh, the 2021 Zookeeper management sim, Let's Build a Zoo, uh, by developer Springloaded, was No More Robots' biggest investment to date and went on to, the plat uh, went on to perform well for the publisher on PC last year. At the end of last month, the game came to consoles, including the Switch and went up for pre-order a week earlier on September 22nd, at which point Rose started to notice something strange. Firstly, it seemed like a good strange. Pre-orders for the Switch version uh, were flooding in, and he was delighted, until he noticed that 85% of the pre-orders were coming from Argentina. Uh, Argentina is not a strong economy, and due to the Switch's regional pricing, uh, the usually $24 game and DLC bundle was priced there at around $1.50. Obviously, these weren't genuine Argentinian sales, and Let's Build the Zoo was the victim of price tourists who, uh, who use various websites to identify the cheapest location to purchase a game, spoof their IP, or register a Switch at account to that country, and then buy the game at its local rate. All of these pre-orders were uh, netting no more robots, only a buck each, and it began to seem like a disaster. I don't understand why they would do that. 
because they're getting the game. It's what the the people buying the game well, for. I understand they're getting the game for cheaper, but I would. I, yes. It seems more. It seems more beneficial if they could turn a profit in some way. Like, is this game? Was this a game that was like a? I guess it's Let's Build a Zoo. Is that? I guess it's like a popular game. I guess people wanted it. Well, the people. Yeah, the people who made. To be clear, the people who made Let's Build a Zoo are not the ones doing this. Right, 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 right. These are that's what it seemed are, like from the title. Right. Uh so these are people who are trying to look trying to buy the game at the cheapest way possible. So they'll find whatever country is selling it um at the you know at the equivalent of a dollar fifty American and buy it there. This right. is a this is a ton of work that is not really worth it in the end. Um but enough people did it um to cause a significant impact to uh no more robots revenue stream. However, due to a weird quirk of the way Nintendo compiles its regional sales, uh it groups all of the Americas when monitoring sales for the US and counts units sold, not revenue. All of those Argentinian pre-orders were being registered by the Switch's algorithms as US interests. And it immediately began promoting the game far more heavily on its storefront to some of the highest paying customers, Americans. Mm -hmm. But that seems uh, reasonable. It, it it seems like these are legitimate sales. They're just, there is a, a pricing uh, a miscalculation and it's Nintendo's fault. Well, it gets better because... Now, you know, now it had high prominence on the America on the US eShop. Mm -hmm. So people could see it on the front page and buy it there. Uh this then saw the EU Switch store think this game was big business and it started being promoted to much of the rest of the world's full price paying nations. By launch day, September 29th, the game was high up on both stores' great deals tab, getting as Rose tweeted Loads more attention than we uh, than we would have got otherwise. It's impossible to measure just how many more sales Let's Build a Zoo will net as a consequence of this situation. But Rose explained to Kotaku that simply being on the deals page on the Switch uh, has previously seen seen his games double their sales rate. Um, he tells he's uh, he says that the game has since performed extremely well on the Switch, describing it as their best launch to date beating out the huge selling cycling sim Descenders. This, of course, course, all leaves a large ethical question. Buying games this way, taking advantage of a smaller economies in the poorer nations, has consequences. Oftentimes, it will lead to developers and publishers questioning whether they should even sell their games in such regions, given how much money they're losing or putting their, pri or putting their prices up to a point where they're locally unaffordable. Uh... 2022 mega hit Sifu is due for release on Switch this month, but Argentinians are reporting that the game will no longer be available for pre-order there. It was previously reported that it was priced at 40 pesos, which is just two US dollars, uh, but links to the former store page are now end in Wario. It seems very possible that this is another example of the phenomenon with the opposite reaction. Uh, Chris, the golf developer, Liam Edwards of Chuni Labs, tweeted to say Friend that the show. studio's recent game faced uh, the same situation. Oh, yeah. That's... Friend of the show. I didn't know what they meant by it. the page ends in Wario, but it, that's their 404 error. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Go, I don't know. I've been staring at this picture of this woman eating meat for some reason. Like, this is just the <laughs> biggest ad on, the, on Kotaku. Uh, but it seemed to me like they, the the way they made the title seem, it seemed like the developer was was doing something nefarious to to scam their way into the the, the top ranks. Um, and one of the previous ways people used to do that was they would make their game on sale for like ninety nine percent off, and people would buy it because it'd be on the sale page. And then they'd once it got to the best sellers, they would switch it back to being full price at like twenty bucks right. or something. And everyone would think it's a great game, and they'd check it out. And you know, then they would just do that over and over again. And once it leaves the best sellers, they would make it like ninety nine cents again or or whatever. Nintendo caught on to this and they uh, made it so that you can't be a bestseller if your game is under a uh, dollar. So then 
they started making it $2 instead. Yeah. Anyway, that's not the case here. It seems like Nintendo just straight up fucked up. And, and for whatever reason, their uh, Argentinian eShop is like way cheaper than everything else. And that's Nintendo's well, it, fault. That, I mean, that's not really Nintendo's fault. That's more, um, I, that's to do with like the economics because uh, Argentina is not a very wealthy nation. It's a much poorer nation than like the US and the EU right. nations are. That is like, you know, world economics that I do not understand well, if the, if the, at all. I understand that, that, uh, 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 the the markets in different countries fluctuate. That's how like uh, uh, the 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 British pound is sometimes more expensive or less expensive yeah. than the American dollar. Like I understand that different economies fluctuate the price of their currency, but uh, making a game that's supposed to be twenty dollars only two dollars that well seems like a massive uh, uh uh difference usually there's like 20, a couple cents difference but this is a massive difference i mean two dollars here might be worth twenty dollars down there that's all that could be a lot to a lot of people i don't know i don't know no, but it's not economics of argentina but it's two u.s dollars for a twenty dollar right. game what i'm saying is two dollars probably goes a lot farther down there than it does up here right so yeah two dollars could possibly mean the difference between buying a game or getting dinner okay so Argentina. you're saying that the country's so poor that uh they need to lower the price of games in order to for these people to be able to afford the games basically yes so that is great then if they're willing to sell these games for so much cheaper to these people but uh the nintendo needs to do some sort of verification process because yeah. right now you can just make an account for a different country with no verification process at all yeah uh i mean you do need like either uh a credit card from that country in order to buy games or you need a eShop card from that country in order to buy games. So it's not exactly easy, but it's easy enough that like a few minutes on Google can tell you how to do it. Also, I think that Sifu was $60, wasn't it? Uh, maybe on PlayStation it was. Because then coming up uh, for $2 is <laughs> it's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, but Ajax it says, I mean, Bob, you've bought games off of the Japanese eShop. Yes, not for cheaper. In fact, I pay more when I do that because I have to yeah. buy the fucking, I have to buy a Japanese eShop card. I only do that to get it earlier or to get yeah. it because it's only available in Japan. Um, I mean, in the end, it did have a happy ending because, you know, it brought, it brought the game to the uh, front page of the, Amer of the US eShop. And then eventually the, the European eShop where more people saw it and more people were able to buy it at its full retail price. Yeah, I don't think this is a bad thing necessarily. Uh, I just, it's a bad thing that turned into a good thing. I mean, I guess it's bad in the sense that people are buying the game for cheaper than it's worth. But, yeah, uh, because let, let's, you know, the thought experiment. If 100 people buy the game at $2, Versus 100 people buying the game at $20, you're not making as much money right. with the you know, 100 people who bought it for $2. I understand. I read the chat, Jackson. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I understand that uh, they're making less money, but in the end, they ended up on the, on the best seller. So it, 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 yeah. it makes, it makes it, a lot of sense. In a roundabout way, it worked out for them. It's just a weird sort of thing that... Uh, Seems like Nintendo needs to do some regulation on, or else it's gonna yeah. it, it it's it's a way for people to get around paying full price for games. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, we got thirty three months from Jackson. Thanks, dude. Thanks so much. Yeah. Jackson, did you win Twitch Rivals today, or was that one of your weird tweets that you let other people write for you? <laughs> uh. All right. What's this? Devs hamstrung by Xbox Series S. Uh, so well, hamstrung's the, weird, a weird word. It it really is. 
Uh, I didn't put this in the keep because I really I'm tired of talking about frame rate controversies and whatnot. Um, but it was revealed that Arkham Knights, the upcoming Batman game, uh, is going to be locked at 30 frames per second on Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. Um, so in this article, while responding to Gotham Knights frame rate controversy, a developer, uh, a Rocksteady developer irked Xbox Series S fans by stating that multi-platform games are hamstrung by its potato GPU. Uh, mm-hmm. Lee, Lee uh, Devo, Devonold, Devo, we are not men, we are Devo, Devonold, a uh, senior character tech, uh, technical artist, took to Twitter to offer his thoughts on the type of bottlenecks and constraints developers face and said that one such bottleneck is the Xbox Series S GPU. This Twitter thread quickly devolved into a war of words when followers pointed out that a number of games run at 60 frames per second on the Series S. For those who haven't been following, Gotham Knights is locked at 30 frames per second on consoles because WB Games wants to provide a seamless co-op experience among other things. This resulted in fans criticizing WB Games with a number of developers jumping into the studio's defense. Uh, Devonold said that he wishes gamers understood what 60 frames per second means in terms of all the things that they lose to make the game run that fast, especially taking into account that we have a current-gen console that's not much better than a last-gen one. Uh, he went on to say that the Xbox Series S is the lowest performer hamstringing an entire generation of multi-platform games. I find that really hard to believe. Hold on, I'm doing a capture where I have to click on pictures of bees. Beans? Bees, like the flying thing. And I got it yeah. wrong! Come on! <laughs> Please click each image containing a bee flying near a flower. I didn't read the whole thing. Hold on a second. Well, I, but do they have to be flying? This one's on it. These are all near a flower. What are That's, you trying? What are you capturing into? <laughs> I got it wrong again. I give up. I got an e- okay. I think I think my Logitech G just shipped, uh, but but it didn't give me like all of the information. But I'm pretty sure it just shipped. Anyway, right. I find it hard to believe that because uh, we were led to believe at the beginning of this console generation that the only. Th- Thing that would be a problem with the Xbox Series S is that it will be 1440p. And whatever right. the power differential is, whatever the graphical limitations of, of, of the hardware for that cheaper console would be just because it's 1440p and that will be made up with the, 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 the way the hardware is. That the only problem would be that it'd be 1440p. Now we're hearing that it can't do a lot of things. That there's all the, like, frame rates an issue now? Yeah. Well, you gotta remember, because when they announced the Series S, Mm -hmm. you know, the specs, in a lot of cases, were actually worse than an Xbox One X. Right. And that could do 4K60 for a lot of games. But but so but the excuse that they gave was that it had other stuff in it that would optimize it in certain right. ways that made the architecture very similar to an Xbox Series X. The only difference in the power difference was going to be the resolution. Right. And there seems I to mean, have been an issue because now we got somebody <laughs> from Warner Brothers who's like, nah, this fucking game can't run like this because of the Xbox Series S. But at the you know, I I do believe that you know the Xbox. I, we all know the Xbox Series S is the least powerful of the Xbox family, and it's also much less powerful than a PlayStation Five. Mm-hmm. It, it can't run games at the same level. So yes, certain concessions have to be made to make sure the game can run on that and run smoothly. But. We live in a generation where, and I don't, I don't really like getting into the whole frame rate debate. I think it's stupid and pointless. As long as the game runs smoothly, 
and doesn't dip, it should be fine. Um, not every game needs to be 60 frames a second, but we've seen this generation developers are making their games compatible for a wide variety of system types, not just PC, which games have to be developed for a wide variety of system types, but on PlayStation, which only has one, you know, hardware skew, um, Games are sh- games are developed with two modes: a performance mode, which will give you that sixty frames a second, or a high fidelity mode, which lowers the frame rate but gives you better visuals, better um, better resolution. So it's not out of the question uh, that games be made in a way that can accommodate the system you're running it on. If if the PC version is able to be at 60 frames per second, then there really isn't any reason why the Xbox Series X version can't be 60 frames per second. And then get, it can be auto downscale to 30 on the Series S. I think the reason being Warner Brothers, and this is like the fourth time this has happened to a Warner Brothers game, they are very bad at optimizing their games for the systems that they make them. Right. We've seen that with Arkham Knight. We've seen that with the Mortal Kombat games, and we're seeing it again with this. I think that's what the issue is. I mean, I'm look, I'm sure uh, Devin old had a point and I'm sure he's not wrong in a lot of respects, but I think history has shown us that Warner brothers as a company doesn't really care all that much about optimization. They just want it to work. Yeah, we were talking about this the other day. Um, We, if we had to guess, obviously we don't work at Warner Brothers, but if we had to guess what the issue here was, it was that uh, the publisher was like, you got to use this engine. And they were like, all right, well, we got to do a lot to make it uh, uh, a, always on co-op and run at 60 frames per second and they were like well it's got to be always on co-op so fucking do something about it and they're like oh god i guess we're gonna have to make some compromises so that makes total sense um i think the biggest news to me here is that they're blaming the xbox series s which i'd like to know a lot more about i'd like to know why exactly that's an issue when we were told at the beginning of the generation that this specific thing would not be an issue is this a scapegoat is this are they just blaming that because it's the easy thing to blame? Um so this game uh Gotham Knights is running on Unreal Engine 4. Okay. Which is at this point how old is that engine? What was Arkham Knight made on? Unreal 3. Wow. Yeah. The thing about Arkham Knight was that game notoriously couldn't run on PC when it launched and it only really worked on console because they poured all of their energy into making it run on console because I don't think they had the resources to make it run on previous gen systems. Um, Gotham Knights, if you remember, if you recall was supposed to launch on Xbox one and PlayStation Mm four, and then they canceled it on those systems. That leads me to believe that they couldn't find a way to make this game work on those systems, even though Unreal 4 is an engine that supports PS4 and Xbox One. Yeah, they it seems couldn't like, it seems yeah, like an optimization they couldn't issue. Make the game work, even though there there should have been a way to do it, given that the engine works on the previous system. I'd like to say that uh, uh, Lee Devenold deleted his Twitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I was going through, I found an archive of it because I, I found it through some discourse he had. Um, uh-huh. Like some, I found it because somebody responded to him. Uh, but I don't know if I should even get <laughs> too into it because he obviously deleted it on purpose. Uh, yeah. somebody, so I'll, somebody said that he, this person, Lee, uh, attacked, uh, Series S developers. 
<laughs> and then and and the least said I've apologized for that. Uh, I'd like to know how badly he attacked Series S developers. Yeah. Did he just say that it's a potato hardware? Because like it, I mean, that's not really attacking. It is the least powerful of the next gen systems. Yeah. I look. He he works at a video game developer, so he obviously has more insight into this information than any of us do. Mm -hmm. He has to know something, and for all I know, he's probably right. It's very hard to make a video game for one system, let alone the three or four they normally have to do, and now you have to make sure that the game works for different offshoots of the same system. You know, there, there was talk about this when they revealed the PlayStation 4 Pro and the Xbox One X. Uh, so the, I, the more I, versions of the game you have to make, the longer development is and the harder it becomes. It just doesn't make any sense for Microsoft to want to make a console that is so underpowered for the next yeah. generation, unless that console would be able to handle everything bar the resolution, which is right. what my interpretation was when they released the console in the first place. Um, so I, I'd like to, I'd like to f know more. About, I'm going to have to dive back into my research from <laughs> fucking 20. When the hell does this come out? 19 and, and, see what exactly it was that made it so that it would just be a resolution issue. But clearly yeah. uh, uh, developers are out here saying that uh, it's not just a resolution issue. It can actually yeah. make the games run worse. So uh, again, I think more than likely some sort of optimization issue because a lot of other companies have been able to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, where are we now? Uh, we're on the last bit of news. Splinter Cell. Uh, the director quit. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, in a post on LinkedIn, uh, director David Gr uh, Grivel said that it was time for him to go on to a new adventure. Uh, Grivel worked on Ghost Recon Future Soldier at Ubisoft Paris before moving to Ubisoft Toronto to work on Splinter Cell Blacklist, Assassin's Creed Unity, Far Cry 4, 5, and 6, and most recently, the upcoming Splinter Cell remake. Ubisoft officially confirmed last December that it was working on a remake of Splinter Cell. Uh, it, it said that the game was being rebuilt with the Snowdrop engine, uh, which also powers the Division and is being used uh, to build Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora, and the upcoming Star Wars game to deliver next-gen visuals for gameplay and dynamic lighting and shadows for the series is known for. Uh, so yeah, the director of the game, the guy who is was leading the whole charge, just left. He's not making the game anymore. I didn't know it was going to be Snowdrop. Uh, that fucking sucks. It's going to be the division. <laughs> and it, I, so I've been boycotting Ubisoft, I said earlier, but like I want them to make more Splinter Cell, so I kind of want to get this, but right. I know that it's... Uh, chances are, it's going to be trash. I'm not going to they, lie. They've, they've said over and over again with this remake that it's going to be a, a linear, single-player game. It's not going to be open world. It's going to be level-based. I would love that. Um, the director leaving makes me think that's no longer true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that this is going to be a fully open world where you're going to have to climb towers to unreal the rest of the map. Um, I want you're level to... design. Like, that, that's... No. That makes for a good game. Not everything needs to be open world. You lose part of the level design there. You can still yeah. have level design in an open world, yeah, but it's I mean, not there's... the same as having a linear experience. There are good open world games with good level design yeah but the mentality behind uh linear uh level by level design and open world design are two different things yeah so when you when you're doing level by level you can specifically tailor every single level to be as unique and uh cater to your style of gameplay as possible when you go open world, you kind of have to make the game work in a variety of different ways. And you can't really like tailor 
you know, if you want to try to make one type of game, you really have to try and make the game an everything type of game. Yeah, uh, this doesn't seem good. I was excited for this game. This doesn't seem good for 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 the health of of it. Uh, yeah, I hope that they figure it out, and I hope that they're able to make something good. But I, I'm I'm uh, skeptical, as I was before, yeah. but now I'm even more. I mean, we uh, won't really know until we see a trailer. We won't see gameplay footage, but yeah, you know, Ubisoft has proven time and again, especially this last generation, that they are okay. Was selling you the same game with a different coat of paint. Yes, uh, which is why I try not to buy their games. Hey, Spark mm-hmm. of Hope comes out this week. Uh, guess who's not buying that? Uh, Scoot. <laughs> das Das Wisco with four months. Uh, thanks, fellas. Thank you for Thank giving you. us money. Uh, Eric Henley with fifty-five months. Uh, and Timmy Two Shoes with five months. Thanks, dude. Uh, that's it. So now we get to do the tweet of the week. Tweet of the week. Yeah. This one's a doozy. We'll strap in. The <laughs> original tweet is the original tweet is an anti-gay Hungarian politician has resigned after being caught by police fleeing a 25-man orgy through a window. And the quote tweet says. Why would he resign over this? What is less gay than fleeing a 25-man <laughs> orgy? The gay thing to do would be to run towards it. I guess the real question is, what was he doing there in the first place? <laughs> yeah, why he did he have like, to run from it? Is the question. Was, was, it, was he just like at a hotel and was going to go in the banquet hall for something? And he's like, oh, this isn't the, uh, the conservative convention. This is an orgy. Whoa! Oh no! Where have where have my pants gone? (laughs) And then he then he runs out with a cartoonish amount of smoke in his trail. Yes. Yes. Anyway, uh, that's the joke. Is that (laughs) that's the joke? Is that he was clearly there for the fucking? Yeah. Anyway. Uh. Hi guys. Now, now we'll now we'll talk to you people. Yes. First, we we talk to people who left comments on last week's Wolf Den podcast over on our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash podcast. We got Dennis Rigdon who says, "Ah, nothing like sc- a screaming New Yorker when you first sit down with a cup of coffee to wake up. Wake up! Grab your brush and put on a little makeup." <laughs> Megan, love it. I would have been just as happy with something like Lou Albano or Bob Hoskins or Charles Martinet, but Chris Pratt is just playing him as Chris Chris Pratt. It's like getting ice cream and it's not even vanilla. It's just cold, sweetened milk. Mm. I'm inclined to agree. Who is Lou Albano? Yeah. Is that the he, Italian guy who was yeah. in that the, uh, movie? The cartoon. No, yeah. Captain Lou Albano. He did the voice of the original cartoon. He was oh. a wrestler in the 80s. Uh, he was the original voice. He did the live action Mario in the original cartoon as well as the voice. Somebody... Do the Mario swing your arms from side to side. That guy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Brian Altano suggested some Italian guy who was in, was it Luca? Yeah, Luca. That would have been yeah, fun. Yeah, I forgot I, I forgot the actor's name, but like, yeah, he would have been perfect. I mean, he doesn't have to be Italian. He just has to be not Chris Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Chris Pratt is, um, he's a very limited actor. He only really has two roles. He has uh, Andy Dwyer from Parks and Rec, and he has Star-Lord. Um which are the same he could guy. do Andy Dwyer very well, as you've seen in the Lego movie and stuff like that. Uh, and Star-Lord only works when James Gunn is directing him because they tried doing Star-Lord in Jurassic World and that didn't work as well. <laughs> uh, Josh Boyda says, if they're going to have Link talk in a Zelda movie, I feel like he'll talk in Breath of the Wild too. That, that would be horrible. Yeah. Unless it's like the climax I mean- and he finally opens his mouth. Yeah, where he's like, they like did with like they did with Metroid. Yeah, where he's just like, "Hey, fuck you, Ganon." <laughs> yes. 
Uh, Mega Man says, Battle Network equals best Mega Man, and you know it too, Bob. I'm blocking you on all of my accounts. Well, he would know better. That's Mega Man. It's true. He is the, the Mega Man. <laughs> uh, Hanuman K1, who says, when talking about the Zelda movie and the discussion about a silent protagonist in a movie, I'd like to point to Wally. There's pretty much no dialogue from Wally, and nobody noticed he has no lines. At least one third of the movie has no dialogue. I knew there were examples. I just couldn't think of an example. I feel like that's different in the sense that Wally isn't human. He's a robot. He is designed to not necessarily look human. He's designed to be a robot. So, so every other character in the movie. <laughs> no, there are humans in there. They're the fat, weird ones that don't really yes. aren't really focal points. And and Fred Willard, who is live action, which is very, um, <laughs> but you know when when humans see a non-human, they don't necessarily expect it to talk. So as long as the the inanimate object is emotive, that works. When you see a human or a human like character, because Link is an elf on screen for a majority of the movie. At a certain point, you're going to expect him to say something other than grunts. What's your problem against so, mutes? Um, there's no. <laughs> Why can't the main character just be a mute? Look, if they make him a mute, if they if they can pull it off in a way that uh, works, good. I'm I think you I just make the supporting characters uh, uh, do the dialogue. I think that that's all you from need to what, do. From what I know of the way mainstream Hollywood filmmaking works, they're going to make him talk. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to prepare ourselves for that. <laughs> and or I just be we, outraged when he does. I mean, for it. that, for <laughs> that. Uh... Big Hero Six. That guy doesn't talk, right? He's talk. Yeah, he talks. He talks. Is he? Does he, he have talks. a limited vocabulary? No. I saw that movie. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're in the chat really quick. All right. Uh, I think Chris uh, Pratt should be Link. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Tech Nanner said Mad Max. Mad Max says a lot more than people realize he says in those movies. So, I mean, yeah, he grunts for a lot of it, but he says full sentences. I for... think they can do a mute protagonist. They just have to be creative with it. God damn it. Okay. Not everything has to be right. formulaic and a blockbuster. You know I'm, what I mean? Look, I'm not saying, like, I don't think it should be formulaic either, but I'm just saying that th that's going to happen. Link's going to talk. We're, we're, and you're all. We're, we're at the point. You're all going to be upset about it. Where. Even the Marvel movies, they're like, we know what we got to do. We got to have, we got, we got, we got to have it start fun. We got to have, we got to have uh, 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 really serious situations with some, with a lot of quips to 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 to, to combat that. Characters got to die at the climax, and then we got to have a resolution here, and then everybody's going to be happy, and there's going to be a lot more quips at the end. And, and they do that for every fucking movie, and everybody else has picked up on that. And 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 that's and we're not creative anymore, Will. Back in my day, did you? Did you I'm I'm sure you didn't see She Hulk, right? No, I've heard bad things. So, uh, spoiler alert for the end of that series, uh. She actually addresses that. <laughs> what, like the Marvel she looks movies at the have camera. been formulaic? Yeah, she looks at the oh, camera because the, the, the final battle is like a big action scene. She looks at the camera and goes, this isn't working for the way my story has been going. Do you people actually want this? <laughs> and then it, oh, okay. not to go any further, but it, it takes quite the turn from there. Interesting. Do you, did yeah. you enjoy that? I did enjoy it. I thought it was fun. I thought She-Hulk was very fun. I thought it was a good representation of the character. I think people just don't understand that She-Hulk is a comedy. <laughs> it's It's been a comedy since the 80s. Uh, and that show was a comedy. Destroyer Gundam says, well, Steve Blue, I, Steve Bloom, I think, 
uh, yeah. makes four million as voice actor. He voiced Wolverine, Krillin, and Toonami Tom. So if makes a lot of money with voice acting, then most other voice actors should be able to make what he was during all those years ago. So I would say Steve Bloom is probably one of the great voice actors. Yeah. <laughs> so like he is going to be at the top of the price range if you want to get a voice actor. Yeah. Um, He's 62. Damn. 40, uh, four million dollars. What a year, a job yeah, like, uh, what, in total. Because something tells me, you know, what was, what was a recent thing he did? He did something tells me he did not get four million dollars for his guest appearance on DC superhero girls or to be Toonami Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, It wasn't he isn't he the uh he was in uh uh that fucking game that came out this year. The 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 first person shooter jump in game. First person shooter Neon White. Jump. He's the main oh, guy yeah. in Neon White. What did he get for that? Did he get f- uh, four million dollars? <laughs> I severely I, doubt that. I doubt that. Uh friend friend in art says give residuals to voice actors. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, that's like the big thing that video game voice actors don't get residuals. Yeah, because they're, I mean, they're a big part of the, I mean, if you're making a video game, a lot of people should get residuals and that's, yeah, you're taking a $60 game and now you're cutting it a lot of different ways. Um, But I mean, if the voice actor is synonymous with the franchise, yeah, they should get a cut. Yeah. Um. He's in Valorant. Yes, I know he's in Valorant. I hear his voice every freaking time because uh, Hannah mains Brimstone. <laughs> um. All right, I'm reading the chat still. Yeah. Uh... I was considering getting a custom standard series controller for my PC, but where it's almost the end of the month, I think I'll just get the new 8-bit do since Switch and PC both. Yeah, when is that out? And am I getting one? (laughs) (laughs) I think it comes out the 28th, but I haven't had any... I haven't heard anything from anybody about it. I would love to make a video on it. Um, Uh, October 28th, according to Amazon. Yeah. That sounds good. Got a lot of video stuff in in the pipeline, and yeah. uh, a lot of weird uh, shipping issues because I'm moving. So <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of issues. Yeah. Uh, Bob, should I buy a second Wii U? I just got one last uh, a week ago, and I love it, but I don't want to mod it. How much are Wii U's going for? I'm gonna say no. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think. Can... I don't think a Wii U is worth modding. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can emulate a Wii, it yes, easy. but like a Wii U, I don't know. Even a Wii, I don't can... know. I don't know if I should, would go that far. Well, because we Wii's are easier to mod. They're they're much more readily available. Hmm. Wii U's are still fairly expensive and like cost prohibitive. So I just don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's worth it. I, uh, no. Uh, Lifted Lightning says, Bob, has anyone yet to accept your OLED giveaway? Yes, and it has been shipped off. They have won and they have taken it. So congratulations nice. to, I forgot his name already. Uh, anyway, it's gotten very late. Uh, yes. We have to go. Goodbye. Yes. All right. <laughs> thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolf Den. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put it up as an archive version over on our YouTube channel, a youtube.com slash Wolf Den podcast. So you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. If you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. We're also an audio podcast on anchor.fm slash Wolf Den podcast or your preferred podcast service of choice. But no matter where you get this show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. I said this on Twitter. I made a little uh, tweet the other day. 
I said that uh, I will be not really doing a lot of Twitch streams for the foreseeable future. I will do my best, but uh, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a backseat because I'm moving uh, in the next few weeks. So it'll be a little bit until I get all that situated and then a little bit when I get set up in the new place. Uh, mm. And I tweeted that and here's a picture of uh, Zim looking like Werner Herzog. Am I wrong? He looks like he looks exactly <laughs> like Werner Herzog here. Um, I could see it. Anyway, uh, go watch AJ. It's been a while since we've rated him. Uh, I will see you later. Who knows when? Goodbye. Bye.